What's happening, everybody, and how the hell might y'all be doing out there? Drinking all the booze in the house? Already blew through all your weed and been throwing solo parties till 4 a.m.? I'm not saying I did that. I'm just saying I could see that being a fairly plausible scenario. Well, the struggle, it appears, would be real, and we're all in it to varying degrees now, aren't we? Hope y'all are staying safe out there. Today's guest is the one and only John Tempesta, who presently plays in the cult and has worked throughout the years with White Zombie, Testament, Exodus, Rob Zombie, and more. So no shortage of stories, and you know, I was thirsty for some of those Pantera decadent stories when Zombie toured with them, so no shortage of laughs in regards to that one either. Good times were had, and I feel it was though we made the best of the uh, phone call scenario of which many of us are living. Be it video conferencing or multi-person calls, however we're getting through it. But it was definitely great, and John made the best of it, and I look forward to actually doing it in person one of these days. If you like what you hear, Crash Bang Boom Podcast can be found on iTunes Podcast, my SoundCloud, and YouTube pages, Stitcher, Luminary, Google Play, Podbean, and more. Feel free to check out any of the previous 170 plus episodes. Give me a like, a subscription, a positive rating, and or a glowing review. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook as well for additional content and updates. The support is appreciated. Shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press. If you're looking at release vinyl, go on over to neworleansrecordpress.com to look at the myriad vinyl coloring, packaging, mastering, electroplating, lacquer cutting options. And you can use that handy little real-time quote generator to keep tabs on all the items. And they print both 12 and 7 inch records in 150 and 180 gram variants. So check them out if you're looking at putting something out. And that's neworleansrecordpress.com. All right, let's get into it. Without further ado, here we go. John Tempesta, rock and roll, and a little cozy pal geek out to boot. Crash, bang, boom. Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, 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 yep. John Tempesta, welcome to the Crash Bang Boom podcast. We're doing it on opposite sides of the coast here, but uh, I'm glad to catch up to you. We got some mutual friends. Shout out to Chris Lee for fucking helping out over here, man. Yo, 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 Chris Lee, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. Yeah, dude. Hey, thanks for having me on your show. Absolutely, man. Uh, how are you making out amidst this coronavirus bullshit? Are you getting fucking stir crazy? Do you have a, a, a minimum yeah. drinking time that you start? I do, but, you know, to be honest with you, um, I'm kind of used to this, like, whole regimen here. Like, after tour, I'm pretty private. I'm a home guy, you know what I mean? Yeah. But there is a point where you could be trapped in your home and, and then go to the store and want to go to a bar and have a drink or, you know, a restaurant. So that's what's fucking me up right now. <laughs> you know totally. what I mean? Totally. I took a bike yeah. ride the other day, and uh, and I was turning down uh, a, a particular street, and just due to force of habit, I was like, ooh, I'll pop into this bar and have a beer and a shot. And I was like, god damn it, the bars are closed. Uh, this just sucks, man, right? <laughs> That's the thing. You want to socialize and, you know, whatever, and go watch the game. Yeah. Right? Man, it's so, it's so insane right now. I mean, it's like the whole world is just is on, like, fucking pause. Yeah. It's 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 really trippy, man. I tell you what, I never realized that I, I must hug dudes a lot because this whole like social distancing thing and like air high fives from mm-hmm. six feet away and talking to people from six feet away. <laughs> it's a fucking bummer. I'm like, come on, man, let's fucking hug. I'm like, when, when can know, I? Let's hug it out, man. Let's, I, I have know. some hugs. Different times, dude. What's going to happen when this is finally over and going to shows and like, dude, don't touch me. And we're like, six feet, dude. Then they're like, oh, shit, I totally forgot about that, man. We're nah. back to normal now and you know what i mean people are gonna gonna trip new york's gonna go crazy man it's gonna be the flesh parade hopefully the sun it'll be some summer weather and everybody that is single that was not able to have sex with random people is they're gonna be like crawling the streets ready to do some fucking that's my prediction oh the bars are gonna be fucking packed man (laughs) crazy can you imagine (laughs) oh Oh, man (laughs) i'll I'll probably be there so yeah i can imagine yeah it's gonna be nuts Right on, dude. In a good way. Yeah, man. Yeah. 
Well, it's good to catch up with you again, man. Uh, you've been in so many bands that I'm uh, a fan of throughout the years, so we'll certainly get into that. Uh, but oh, just cool. Thanks, man. Kind of off the bat here, uh, how has coronavirus uh, sort of affected your uh, touring, recording plans, et cetera, et cetera? Did you have anything that was set in motion that this is kind of throwing a wrench into the works? Yeah, there was a couple things, but you know what? The, the the good thing that came out of this, we were uh, I just finished my drum tracks that day with um, my other band, Motor Sister, that I'm in, nice. and we recorded at Dave Grohl Studio. And I just finished that day, and a friend of mine. Uh, this girl I know, her friend's friend uh, knows the governor of California and said there's going to be a lockdown. So that's come. I was done. I'm like, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to the market, stocking up. And that's what I did. So wow. and it, so at least I got that whole record done right now. They still need to do vocals, but all the basics are done, which is cool. Um, nice. But, yeah, unfortunately, we had uh, shows lined up for the cult. We had a couple shows uh at the end of this month and next next month May, then we had June and July in Europe. So that's all, you know. Right. It's gone. And so we're trying to, you know, reschedule stuff for late August if we could do it by then. Hopefully. Yeah, that seems to be the timeline that I'm seeing more and more with reschedule tours yeah. as people are kind of expecting to be able to get back out there come late August, early September. So that seems to be the kind of consensus with the way this might time out. Fingers crossed, man. We need music. We need live music. We need to get the fuck out of the house, you know? I know. I'm ready to hug some dudes, have some drinks, and listen to some live fucking rock and roll <laughs> Let's already. Go, man. <laughs> fucking dude fucking hugging. Let's go. <laughs> oh, my God, man. <laughs> Well, uh, Exodus uh, Impact is imminent record. That came out in 90. 1990, yeah. Yeah, so I was actually 14. So I remember uh, when I, I had the cassette tape and I was able to drive at 15 in southeast Louisiana because that state is insane, especially in the late 80s and early 90s. But uh, oh, fuck that was, yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the cassette tapes that I had. And if I would have told my 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 uh, 15 then 15 year old self that I would be talking to the drummer that played on the Exodus record on a podcast first of all I'd say well what the fuck is a podcast and then if somebody <laughs> right. it, yeah and then if somebody explained to me that it like goes out over the internet I'd be like well, what the fuck is the internet you know like all of this is uh, yeah right totally Man, it's just so fucking back to the future dude um, totally you know it's funny on top of that that's the first record I've ever done in my life that one are you serious Yes, I am. That was like I just, you know, got into the band. Um, well, I was I was the you know, drum tech for Anthrax for right. I was Charlie's tech for a while. That's how I got the gig. They opened up for Anthrax and they'd see me sound check, and that's how I got the Testament gig as well. The same thing. Both bands opened for Anthrax. You know, being there and you know, seeing me play, and it's like it's being the right place at the right time, man. And I always say, you know, the next next best thing is like if you're not in a band, at least go out and check. You're on the road. You're meeting people, and, and you know. And they get to see you play, so it goes a long way, man. Yeah. What record were you teching for Anthrax on? Because uh, I'm a big fan of Charlie Benante, so uh, I'd be curious just, like, what the timing was when you were, I guess, teching for them. See, Charlie and I are really – we're high school friends, man. You nice. know, we went to high school and stuff, so uh, it's – well, I got to go back. I did the whole Among the Living tour. Awesome, dude. That record rules. Yeah, I did the whole tour. Well, what happened was, because Charlie was like, hey, man, I was in the band in New York at the time, and the singer left, and blah, blah, blah. We couldn't find anybody. And Charlie was like, why don't you come on check with me? He goes, you know everything about drums. It would be a fucking blast. I'm like, really? And they were opening up for Metallica, Master of Puppets, actually when Jason Newstead just got in the band, right? Wow. But would have Anthrax was on that tour when Cliff died. So that that was that wow. whole time off. So they were doing uh makeup dates and back then. So we did that for two weeks. I'm like, Oh, this is fucking awesome. I'm in you know, I'm hanging out with my friends all day long. I'm out at my parents' house. I'm getting paid, I'm seeing the world. <laughs> I'm watching Charlie play every night and this is fucking amazing. So I'm like, This is cool. He goes, We're going to Japan, man. Come with us. I'm like, Fuck yeah. So I went to Japan. I was even better, you know, and, and my dad was into that too. Because my dad, you know, he's an airline mechanic and he loved the whole traveling aspect of it all and so and so yeah, so I did Japan and like, and that was it, man. They would they you know working on Among the Living, and uh, actually they were they recorded Among the Living, and after that I did the whole tour, man, and that went on for a few years, and that's how I got my gigs, man. Exodus and Testament. 
Wow, that is <laughs> that is truly trippy, man. Did you did you have to audition for Exodus, or were they, or were they just like we no, think you could do it from seeing? No, that's the thing. You? It's like they had a tour already booked, right? Like they had. Uh, what happened was Tom Hunting was a drummer at the time, well, the original drummer, but um, he had to leave the tour due to some medical issues, and they brought in Perry Strickland from Violence. It was the Headbangers Ball Tour. Mm. And then Perry was going to violence. He couldn't do the whole thing like the next tour. So they were like, well, we asked Johnny with Zetro and stuff. I'm like, oh, he's a badass. And like, and I, I never played that type of music before. I mean, I played, yeah, I could play metal and stuff, but not thrash metal, and especially fucking Exodus stuff, right? So, right. Um, and so they were like, hey, you know, I had to talk with the band. Like, we're doing this tour. Would you be able to do it? And I'm like... Fuck! I'm like, wow! I gotta think about this. And I said, that, and I was talking to Charlie. I go, I never played this shit, man. So I basically learned all the stuff just watching them. And I didn't audition for them because they had a tour book. So I went home to L.A. at the time. They're in San Francisco, and I'm listening to songs over and over and over again. I'm like. How about this really sucks? But anyhow, the audition went good. You know, everybody's into it. And the first show was at fucking Lemoore's in Brooklyn, my hometown show, right? I'm like, come Geez. on. And then we had to go on till 1.30 in the morning. And like Billy Milano's back there. He's like, and I'm fucking all day long. I'm waiting. I'm nervous. My first show. And I'm like, we don't go on till 1.30 in the fucking morning, you know? Yeah. But it was fun, man. Had a good show. And that was it, man. From then on, we did the whole tour. It was a summer tour in 89. And uh, it was a blast, man. And then they got their record deal through Capitol. And we did that. That was the Impact of Zimmerman record we did, man. Unbelievable. <laughs> Those are some fun times, man. Yeah. That is fucking unbelievable. Just the sequence of events from you teching with, with Charlie and then, uh, and then the Exodus gig and then the bizarre scenario, full circle scenario of you playing a show in Brooklyn, you know, when you grew up, when you're a New Yorker, like that's, that's, that's crazy. It is crazy, right? Uh, and, and, and with one of the like preeminent thrash bands in the history of thrash in Exodus, no less. Right. Uh, and uh, honestly, I learned so much, you know, uh, you know, learning the gig and the songs and watching Charlie, that's where I got obviously really helped me out. Charlie, you inspired me to play that stuff and to watch it and, Actually, it's just tricky, man, because on top of it, Tom Hunting's lefty, and it's very tricky. Some some of the stuff is cut sounds backwards, you know what I mean, because he's lefty in that aspect. So, yeah, man, I was like, oh, <laughs> what's that guy doing? But it was, I, did a, I did a lot of stuff my way. I tried to emulate, like, Tom's playing, but um, it was fun, man. They dug in. When, you know, I just it was a great experience for me, man. And that record was my first record, and I, I got an endorsement with Sonar. I had this amazing kit the band bought for me, and they were so, they were so nice, and we just had a great time, man. Well, in between, it, from looking at the dates, uh, it looks like after you had, had after you did Force a Habit in '92 with Exodus, then you were in Testament for for a stretch, and then I guess y'all did Low in like '94. So, uh, out of Exodus and into Testament, what was it like then dealing with uh, and learning some of the back catalog of Testament? Because man, I was obsessed with Practice What You Preach and Souls of Black and stuff. Like, though, I loved those records so much. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew a lot of those songs, but you know what? To be honest with you, Testament was more my style. You know what I mean? Like, like with Exodus is like crazy, like right. thrash and fast, and which I love, and I love playing that. But Testament is more like in, in the groove. I, I gave it a lot more groove to it, you know. And like that's where the low record came out, right. man. You know, it was like it, it was heavy, and I just I just felt more into it with that. I could totally see that. Yeah, man, I unfortunately never got to see Testament back in the day, but I had Testament posters on my walls and like... <laughs> You're a real fan, man. Yeah, like it, I had this one giant Testament poster behind my drum set along with all these other band posters and shit. So whenever I go back in like my family photo album and, and look at pictures of myself playing my first drum set, there's a giant Testament poster behind it, which is just hilarious. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. That's what freaks me out. Like, I, you know, thinking back, like, 
I, being, you know, in high school playing and, you know, my drums and having my band posters in my room and, like, I had, like, Terry Bozio, Simon Phillips, Tommy Aldridge and, like, all these fucking legends and, and like, I'm friends with these guys now. It's, you know, I'm, like, you know, sitting there and just practice, put your headphones on with the fucking lava lamp going on all dark and air playing and, like, it's, like, it's <laughs> fucking, it's like, what's going on here? And, like, and I, and I, I still get tripped out. Like, I know Simon, I know Terry, and I still get nervous because I'm still that little kid, which is it's cool, you know what I mean? You don't want to lose that. Yeah, man. Well, uh, in 95, I would say, is a particularly uh, important year for what you released in, in the White Zombie Astro Creep 2000 record. I mean, my God, man, when I think about the mid-90s, every bar that I went to, it was like... Because, once again, growing up in southeast Louisiana, there was like this kind of, I don't know if it was the semi-redneck inflection in Rob Zombie's voice or whatever, but I got to say, rednecks fucking loved White Zombie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so everywhere I went, I was like, God, man, rednecks are loving this this White Zombie shit. <laughs> oh, I could see that. Yeah, man. Yeah, definitely. Well, tell me a little bit about uh, how you joined that band, because it's interesting. Uh, we have a mutual friend as well, which is uh, another Chris Lee connection in Sean, the bass player of White Zombie. And I've, I've talked to her. I've talked to her throughout the years about the early years of White Zombie and how they kind of started out as uh, kind of like this noise rock uh, kind of band, you know, that was like hanging out in the Bowery and doing this this whole thing. And then uh, it's it's really interesting because I talked to uh, Phil Paleo of uh, the Swans and he played in Cop Shoot Cop back in the day. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. He, w he was telling me about seeing White Zombie when they first started coming around and how they were kind of this noise rock band. And then, boom, you know, they put out the record prior to the one that you're on, which was also a big, big record. And then you joined the band. So I guess tell me a little bit about joining it and some of the subsequent tours that you went on, especially what y'all did with Pantera. Oh man, that was a whole different life changing thing for me. Um, I was, I was with Testman. We just finished, uh, we finished a low record and about to mix and we were mixing with in LA with Michael Wagner, as a matter of fact. And it's, mm -hmm. it's crazy because, um, my name kept coming up for White Zombie. I was with Testman, obviously, in the Bay Area. I was coming back and forth, and they're based in L.A. And so I'm like, yeah, man, they were trying people out. And so I'm like, all right, next time. So uh, I, was in, I got in touch with the uh, tour manager at the time, Ted. And the cool thing was my apartment at the time was like five minutes away from where they rehearsed at. So I'm like, all right, I learned the song. And the one wow. song that he sent me, it was the latest thing, was Feed the Gods. And I'm like, oh, this is heavy, man. I love this. It's got that, like, you know, it's the zombie, but it had, like, Pantera to it. It was way heavier, right? Double bass and everything. I'm like, oh, uh -huh. I'm into this, man. So, Because I've seen him a few times. I've seen him open up for <laughs> Anthrax. Like, they're cool, but man, with a good, like, fucking, like a heavy drummer, like playing real heavy with this, would be massive, you know? And so I was into it. And, I, and it was at the time where, like, you know, they were they were getting big. You know, with the whole Beavis and Butthead and, and just you know, people were really starting to recognize right. him and all. And uh, so... I was in L.A., and so I talked to Ted. He goes, yeah, look, you want to come in a certain day, blah, blah, blah. I get home. He calls me, and he goes, hey, you know, I had an audition for the next day. But he goes, hey, I'm at the studio now. If you want to come down, yeah, I can show you, you know, give you some tips, you know, because he knew my brother. He knew the other guys in Anthrax, so he kind of wanted me in there, right, So, which was a great thing. So I went down there, and the kid was set up by all the gear, and he was like, yeah, you don't want to do too much, and blah, 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 and they had triggers and all this stuff that the drummer Philo was playing at the time, Phil, and mm -hmm. so he showed me how to do those things. I'm like, oh, this is cool. I was playing, and I just went up and started playing, and like started soloing and said, he goes, oh, that's cool, no, but you don't want to do all that stuff. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but he was great, man, and uh, he really helped me out on, the, on uh, getting that gig. And so the next day, I was trying to remember – if it was Feed the Gods, or I believe, if you ask Shauna, I believe it was uh, Black Sunshine. It was the first song we jammed, you know, mm -hmm. drums and bass, and we just locked it in, man. It was fucking, it went, and Rob was sitting there, he kind of lifted his head, and like, oh, cool, you know? And and after that, this is the funny part. Like, they're like, cool, man. We played a few songs, and they had me come back again, because Rob you know, promised his other drummer to come in there to audition. He flew in for somewhere. I don't remember. But... So it's all going good, yeah. and but I'm like, oh, cool. But I'm I'm still in testament, right? I'm like, we're jamming, and then I'm like, but nobody say right. anything to me, but like, oh, you're in the band, right? And we're like writing new record, like Astro Creep songs, and they're jamming and everything. And we had a gig at the Viper Room, 
it was for the uh, Airheads thing. Uh, it was like, you remember, you know, remember that? That's where Feed the Gods was featured in that. So Okay, right. And so we're playing the Viper Room. It was my first show with them. And it was killer. We played like three, about four songs. Like freaking Chris Farley and Tom Arnold introduced us. It was awesome. Like, this is amazing. And MTV's filming it. And I'm like, but I'm like, wow, great. So afterwards, after the bar, you know, after the show, hanging out at the bar, I'm talking to the manager, Andy. I'm like, hey, so what's going on in the band? I'm like, we're writing this record and like, you know, I'm going to do a testament. Let these guys know. It goes, Nobody told me anything. He goes, oh, no, you're in the band, mate. <laughs> I'm like, all right, cool. Well, <laughs> no I say, yeah, isn't that funny? Nobody said anything. Like, hey, welcome to the group. And let's <laughs> rock it out. So, no, too funny. <laughs> I was like, fuck, I, I guess I better let the other guys know I'm in this band, you know? So Astro Creep 2000 comes out, obviously more human than human, a, a huge song. That record, like I said, was was seemingly ubiquitous in like bars in the South. People just absolutely loved it. I was like, y'all are an honorary Southern band. <laughs> Uh, which also leads me to the Pantera, uh, y'all touring with Pantera. Yes. Uh, but tell me, tell me a little bit about sort of uh, how you were witnessing the band sort of ascending and getting. I, I feel like even bigger with with what was going on. And I mean, was it a bit of a shock? It was honestly like. I sometimes uh, there's so much stuff has happened in that short time. Like you know, we were in the top ten when that record came out, Astro Creep 2000. We were in the top ten for two months straight, man, and it was like Holy huge. Shit. We were doing David Letterman show. We did that a couple times and like MTV award bullshit and uh, did that and right. <laughs> and then you know these great tours and then I'm getting plaques and like. You know, it went from gold, and that was a big thing for me because, you know, my dad, he was always like, this is a funny story. I always say this one. You know, you know, obviously he wanted me to go to school, college, and everything, but I was like, that ain't going to happen. You know, I'm a drummer, and that the whole anthrax <laughs> thing was cool being a drum tech, right? Then I get the gigs at Exodus right. and test him, and my dad is Italian, big, strong accent. He was like, okay, yeah. so what are you, you were in the Exodus and then the Testament. Uh, what's the next band, the Ten Commandments? <laughs> of course that's a logical progression Anyhow, i was like so it was kind of like proving myself yeah i was in i was in good bands but zombie was big i was they were, they were just blowing up and then uh then once i got that gold record i gave him the gold record that was that was a big thing for me man you know it's like i i got here with wow. this and then it went platinum then it went double platinum then you know triple platinum it was it was a it was a very very big record Fuck. and People dig it, man, until this day, which is kind of cool, and it still holds up, man, I think. What is triple platinum? How many? That's uh, three million how, records. How Fuck. <laughs> Nobody does. That shit's like, that's like Taylor Swift shit, you know, if anybody now. <laughs> I mean, my God, three million is, wow, that is so much. I know, it's crazy. It's so, yeah, sometimes it's like... And everything is flying by, and sometimes I would sit in like in my other room. I have all my snare drums and my drum room. All, I hang up records, and sometimes I'll just sit there and trip out and go, holy shit, what the fuck happened, man? <laughs> in a good way, you know what I mean? Totally. I'm like, I'm tripping out. I got all these Grammy nominations and, you know, gold records and platinum records, and it's, it's so cool, man. Uh, it, it was an amazing experience, and uh, I'm, I'm so grateful for that, man, being able to see the world and play these giant shows, these you know, bigger, you know what I mean, big arenas with Pyro and, and with Pantera. It was like... And their buddies of ours, it did so well, and the crowds, they were fucking loving it, man. And the death tones opened up on top of it, man, for half of it. Right. Unbelievable, man. Well, uh... Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a good time back then, man. Like, in, in, in that era, like in the 90s, especially for metal, like 95, you know, in the, in the, whole, in the whole 90s, actually. But it was a good time, man. It was great. Well, tell me a little bit about the uh, torn with Pantera because I, I've been a fan since Cowboys came out. I had the VHS tapes. 
I was just like, this band is the shit. And then when Vulgar Display of Power came out, I was like, all right, this band has taken it to the next level. It's one of those super seminal records that remind me very specifically of the year that it that it came out. Yeah. Which I believe was also 1992, the same year that that uh, Le Sex Aristo uh, from White Zombie came out. I believe both of those were the same year. But I knew I knew Pantera before that. See, this is the thing. When I was a, when I was Charlie's tech with Anthrax, uh, Charlie and those guys knew Rita and and Dimebag and uh, I don't know. I I think I how they met them. Like this is we're talking about like 1987. You know what I mean? Right. And so we went to that bar, Joe's Garage, and hung out and and. Anyhow, those guys weren't there. It was just me and John Rooney, Scott Ian's guitar tech. So anyhow, we went to this bar. It was a cool bar. They were like the fucking local band, you know? And they, they played it like every week. And with the tightest fucking band, they played covers and then their originals. So anyhow, like, you guys want to come up and jam? And John was a guitar player. And we played Madhouse with Phil and Rex, man. It was fucking amazing. Whoa. We had a day off, but yeah, with Anthrax, and we went up and jammed with, with Pantera. And then after that, I mean, no, no one the guys seen them. And then I got a copy from uh, got Concrete, Walter O'Brien, Pantera's manager, Andy Gould. I got a cassette, an advanced cassette of Cowboys from Hell. And then yeah. they got signed to Echo and all this. I'm like, wow, this shit's badass, man. I really liked it. And as soon as I heard it, right, it was like, this is new. This is fresh. Right. And so oh, yeah. I, I, the Exodus the extra record impact is them, and it came out in 1990, and us suicidal Tennessee, a co-headlining tour, yeah. and a Pantera was the opening band, dude. We destroyed that tour, man. It was insane. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow is right. We got in some shit. We got some trouble, man. It was, but it was good trouble. It was fun, and those are some amazing. But Pantera, man, woo, they were ferocious, man. I was scared to go on after them sometimes, man. <laughs> I fucking bet, man. I, it's one of those things where I've revisited. You know, I've always kind of, as I said, like Vulgar Display or Power was always kind of my favorite record. Oh, yeah. But I recently went went back and listened to Cowboys from Hell as well because that was my, my introduction to them. And in particular, the ninth song, I believe it is, Medicine Man, yeah. off, off of that record. Uh -huh. Phil has some of the most badass, like Judas Priest-esque rock and roll fucking Woo. Yeah, he could sing high, man. But uh, I actually, it's, it's great. It, Vinny gave me, uh, he he got me actually a Cowboy from Hell gold plaque that I have here. It's, no, it's fucking platinum. I have it in my drum room here. Wow. And I gave him an Astro Crip. I gave him a double platinum for this strip club. No way. Yeah, a million. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, had to, that's, why, cause that's what he did. And yeah, the old fucking, that was a fun place, dude, back in the day. All the bands would pull the tour buses up and hang out at Vinnie Paul's place. It was great, man. The clubhouse, really? man. Yeah. It's good times, man. I miss those days. I forgot that he had a titty bar. That's hilarious. Yeah, out of Dallas, Fort Worth. And yeah, man, we just had so much fun back in the day. I miss those guys, man. May they rest in peace. They were fucking awesome. I know. What players, man. You couldn't fuck with those boys. I'll tell you that, man. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those freaky things, man. You know, you have like Van Halen and uh, obviously ACDC. When I think about brother bands, yep. uh, what a fantastic combination those two brothers were. And of course, as you said, rest in peace. Man. Well, I told them, I was like, you guys are the... You guys are the closest thing to Van Halen I've ever seen. And I seen Van Halen in 78 open up for Black Sabbath. And I didn't even know who Van Halen was. And they fucking smoked Black Sabbath. That's what, that was the, <laughs> I, I haven't seen anything since then with what with, with Pantera did, man. They were that band. Like, they were ferocious. They were right. scary, man. Yeah, yeah. Grooved like a motherfucker, yeah. man. I think the, the shuffle. Yeah. You know what it was, man? I, I think growing up playing the blues, having a Texas thing, and that shuffle, the shuffle found its way into their their their, their grooves. Yep. ZZ Top thing going on there, too, man, you know? Fuck yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Ah, Absolutely. man. That was some good times, though, man. I wish, uh, God, that tour, that was a good fucking tour, man. We sold out everywhere on that one. Yeah, I y'all came y'all came through New Orleans, and I remember my my friends that went were like that was the craziest fucking show ever. Like, it was just one of those shows that I just, I didn't go to, but uh, man, everyone that went was like, oh man, like I think White Zombie really won a lot of people over because uh, I heard a lot of people talking uh, about that band after that tour. 
But uh, do you have any particular memories that that strike you as just being like absurdly funny or just like a, a, a bizarre? Oh man, every every time because those guys will like do shots, you know, the, the, you know, the black tooth grins and all that. And every time like I try to sneak away and they see me, they just have a shitload of people and you know playing cards, listening to music. I'm like, I'm like. I'm trying to sneak away because I didn't want to drain. Like, Tempesta, get in here, man. You know, so that was it. You, you have to do shots. You don't say no to them. So I was like, oh, fuck, here we go again. And uh, it, was, it was like that every night, man. And we're just like, oh, and there was a great time. It was the Kiss Reunion Tour. I remember this one. We had a day off. It was Kentucky. This was 95. That's right. It was 1995. And yeah. the first show was in Detroit, right? That was the, that was the first show of that mm-hmm. tour. And so the second one was in Kentucky, and we had planned it out, like, that the bus was going to take us, both bands, and we had seats. We all went to see Kiss, and I actually had my, my fucking pamphlet from Alive One, the, you know, the, the, the color book, the booklet and stuff from Alive One. Right. I, had it, I had fucking had it in a FedEx tube, and I'm like, I'm getting this sucker signed. And they all signed it to me, man. We just had the best fucking time. Wow. And then after that, we went to this club close by, and there was a Kiss cover band playing. So it was, yeah, I was like, this is amazing. Couldn't get any better than this. Unbelievable. And we, of course, we were drunk, you know. Because we were, <laughs> we were young, man. We were kids. Good times, so. though. Right. It's amazing, man. I mean, obviously, I, I've been able to monitor it uh, pretty good with the drinking and partying and everything. And sometimes I obviously go, go a little crazy. And I'll tell you what, man, I, I, I was joking on the last podcast that I did at the top of it that just being shut in and not being able to hang out with people, I've been having like drunken, weed smoking, play record parties with myself until four in the fucking morning. <laughs> Your own parties, yeah. But the thing is, I start if I do, I have my like you know little hang parties and stuff, and I'll start a little bit earlier. But I'm crashed out by kind of early. But I get the vinyl going and start cranking up, and my neighbors into it, so I'm looking at them like, what's going on? You know, we almost had like a fucking vert, you know, like a, a sixty foot like block party, staying away block party. It was kind of funny. <laughs> the wave, man. Anyhow, we're all we're all getting through this, man, and uh, we have no other choice. We're on the same page, and we'll, we will get through this. Everybody just kind of needs everybody just needs to chill and just kind of relax and you know have faith, man. That's the that's the main thing. Absolutely, man. Um, is there are there any other uh, Pantera stories that uh, you would want to tell? You just want Pantera stories, don't you? I want at least one more. <laughs> um, any, well, Pantera, let's see. Uh, I, I mean, I remember flying into Dallas doing a drum clinic, and I hung out with Vinnie Paul. Like, he picked me up. Well, no, he didn't pick me up. He met me. I went to hang out with him at the clubhouse, and I crashed at his night at his house, and we just got fucked up. And his drum tech, Cat. Do you know Cat, who he is? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, he was just, he'd be working for Vinny, like, as a drum tech. He just didn't sit there. He would, like, he was part of the show. He'd headbang and throw chairs around and stuff like that. And Vinny <laughs> loved it while he was playing it, you know, playing drums live. He, he just fucking got more into it as the crazy he got. So, right. anyhow, we just had a, a good time after that one. And, uh, ah, man. You know what? We would play, like, with Zombie on that tour, we'd play softball here and there. I just... Hanging out, just, you know, dress room, going, you know, days off and just going to strip clubs. And it was the <laughs> 90s, man. That's what we did. We just hung out. But nothing more crazy than that. You know, get out and sing with them every once in a while, you know, this love or, you know what I mean? Right. Oh, man. I'm, I'm so jealous that you got to see that band that many times. I mean, what a great band to be on a tour with and be like, uh, if you're going to see a band repeatedly, you it might as well be a band like Pantera. Yeah. That's what we watch. We watch, I watch this show every night, man, just having fun. And, you know, they're, they're our brothers, man. And uh, just the respect. And yeah, it, just, it was just great, man. I, I, I honestly miss those times a lot. And I wish I could turn the clock back right now so everybody could come to that show. You know what I mean? <laughs> How killer would that be, right? Fuck yeah, man. Yeah.
2004 Helmet puts out Size Matters. Uh, you were playing drums on that record, and y'all came through New Orleans, and I went to that show. And one of the things that really struck me, because I've also spoken to John Stanier, who's one of my dr- absolute drum idols, once again. Oh, I love you know, John. Like, I just seen him at the NAMM show, man. No way. That's awesome. And I never, we never met each other before. That's the funny thing. We, it was like, dude, we never met before. And I'm a big John Stanier fan, so. Right. Yeah. Well, I feel like when I saw Helmet that night, I heard you play quite a few of his fills, or maybe it was just the really a lot. crucial ones. I was like, this dude is playing, like, nailing a lot of John Stanier's fills. That was fucking I impressive. did. I, I, I tried to honestly, because what happened was a friend of ours, he knew Paige, he knew me through a mutual friend, my best friend in New York. Anyhow, he was saying Paige is moving out to... L.A. He's living out in L.A. at the time, and I, I've been here for a while, and, and I got done with Rob Zombie, and, you know, we'd taken a break. He didn't really want to do anything for a while, so I wanted to jam, so he put us in contact. He was like, hey, Paige wants to jam. Why don't you guys get together? Renee's really good like, at that, you know, putting, bringing people together and stuff, right. and, you know, managers, and that's what he does, nice. awesome singer, and blah, blah, blah. So we met at the, um, what is that, Irish bar? Yeah, man, what the fuck? Oh, Cat and Fiddle, one of my favorite places. So, nice night out, hanging out, just bullshitting, and and I loved I loved Hellman, and I, those guys always kind of like they're like they're tall motherfuckers, man, you know, <laughs> and, and they mean business, right? So Paige is a tall dude. I'm like, wow, I was like, this guy, we have nothing in common, but you know what I mean? Because I'm like a metal guy, he's like this jazz dude, and you know, crazy Hellman shit. But by the end of the night, dude, we had we had some drinks and a couple shots of Jägermeister, and he gives me a CD. I'm like, ah, I don't want to listen to that. Let's just get together and jam, right? All the Oh, and at the end of the night, we're just fucking, he loves Zeppelin, I love Zeppelin, ACDC is his favorite band, and so is mine, so that, so we just had so much in common, to, you know, and I was like, wow, this is crazy. I go, listen, I got a little drum room, why don't you bring an amp over and we'll fucking jam. Yeah. Because you know? sure, man, came over, plugged in, right then and there, we just clicked, man, it was like, oh, this is heavy, this is what I've been wanting, you know? <laughs> That's amazing. Listen, after a while playing with White Zombie and Rob Zombie, it's all on click track, right, for right. all the other underlaying stuff. I'm like, and this is great because this is all helmets is raw, man. You're just going, and you're playing some crazy time signatures, and, you know, Stanger did some sick shit, man. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So, anyhow, I just had a blast. And Paige is one of my best friends right now, I mean, since nice. that time, so... Yeah, we, we, yeah, it's a brotherhood, and I'm going to be honest with you, it wasn't the scale of, like, the zombie stuff, but I was kind of like, it was nice going back to, you know, to your roots, you know what I mean, playing right. clubs and, you know, nice size venues and just a tight band, and I was able to bring in my high school buddy, Frank Bello from Anthrax. Nice. You know, we we're, were in a high school band together. That's I'm like, right. how funny is this? So I brought Frankie in. And he yeah. was at Anthrax at the time. So talk about hanging, having the best time with your best buddy, you know? So right. it was a vacation, and we're playing and we're playing our asses off. And, and Chris Trainer is in the band at the time. He was in Bush now. So, okay. I mean, dude, we didn't fuck around, man. We, we took it down, man. Honestly, that band was tight. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's crazy. Was it, was it a process learning some of those fills and really getting into like the John Stanier mode to do that stuff kind of justice? Cause it, it was. I listened a lot. I really, I really got down and listened and I practiced a lot at that time. I remember because I'll tell you, it was with Blasco, Rob Blasco. I brought him in first, right? It was just Paige. Me and and it's like, hey, we need a bass player. Let's bring in Rob, right? right? And we would just jam. We did some demos, and then we got the record deal for Size Matters. And Blasco's in the band at this time, right? Right. And it just so happened at the time he got the call for Ozzy. He went to audition for Ozzy. He got the Ozzy gig. And so Chris finished playing bass on it. And that's why he brought Frankie in. So that's how it happened, man. So, wow. I'm tripping myself on I'm trying to remember all this stuff. <laughs> Seriously, but yeah, yeah, that's what happened. And Frankie had him there. But yeah, at the time, I was really listening to Helmet a lot. Oh, oh, okay, this, that's what it was. We go back to um, we met the Cat and Fiddle many, uh, after the first so I can, uh, hang with me and Paige, we went back with the band itself. It's like, hey, guys, um, we're not studying. I got great news. Jimmy Ivey contacted me. He wants to put Helmet back together. I was like, what? I was like, whoa. And I was like, oh, man, I don't want to do Helmet. I don't want to be that guy that fucking, 
you know, has to play like John Stanger and stuff like that. You know, I just, I love Helmet, but I just want to do her own thing. But then I got it. It's like, yeah, it's just like, let's go out and fun. This is, I wrote all these songs, this and that, and it was a different band. And like, so I, I, I paid really, I paid a lot of attention to detail to learn the songs and do them like John did. Right. You know it's I mean? one of those things where the, I think riff wise, there's not much deviation. So kind of the guy that went off right. in the band was John Stanier, which. Oh, yeah, man. In doing yeah. so, si- almost similar, uh, although he's obviously, I think, more consistent. Uh, the same way that I mm-hmm. think um, uh, Keith Moon sort of was like the wild card in in The Who. I, I feel like John right. Stanier was like a, a, a even more consistent like guy that. When I think about those songs, it's almost like his drum parts, his fills even, are kind of like part of the melodic part of the song. So, Oh, man, yeah, he's a big part of that, definitely. He's a good, like, writer in, in a sense of a drummer playing for the, like, you know, like like sections and, you know, he just went off. Like you said, it was great. It sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, you ended up back in Testament after Helmet, right? No, I, I did go back. I, it was before that. It was it was uh, 2004. I get my years wrong. Where, where Eric and I, we um, well, Testament did with Chuck Billy. We were talking. We should make these songs heavier. So we went back and uh, we re recorded the first two records uh, of Testament. And, and honestly, it was just me and Eric doing a recording together with uh-huh. Doug Hall, Iron Maiden, Soundman in there. They had a studio in Oakland. He had the whole like recording board and everything. And it was just me and Eric. We we just we kind of, you know, made it a little bit heavier, and I, wow. and then I did a tour after that with the original lineup with Louie and stuff. So that was a lot of fun. No, but the tour didn't come to later. See, that's the thing. I did the record, and then later on we did the tour. So I got to look at the years on that, man. Yeah. And that was fun. There's a, actually a live DVD. It's called uh, Live in London. Okay, with Testament. The one we did. Well, yeah, with all of us. Like, I come out the first, like, eight songs, and then they introduce Louis Clemente, the original drummer. Right. And he comes and finishes the set. So that was a lot of fun. Like, dude, I'm done. I'm going to go grab a beer now, and I'll watch <laughs> these guys play. It was fucking awesome. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? That is this hilarious. Is cool shit. I get to watch my buddies play after I get done. I love it. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. I was like, this is fun. I want to do more stuff. Wow, man. Um... Live in London was 2000. So so when I did the Testament first strike, that I believe was 2002 because I moved back from New York to um, L.A. in 2001. And I believe it was, it was the next year. Let's see. Hold on. Sometimes it's like, I mean, it's great that I did so many fucking records with them and stuff, right? But like, right. sometimes I just can't remember. Like with any band, I'm like, I'm trying to remember the years, man. That's okay. I'm, I'm looking at it. I mean, <laughs> so, I think. I'm just joking, man. I'm like, hold on. I can't remember fucking shit right now because <laughs> every day is fucking the same day. Okay. <laughs> right. That was 2001 when I moved back. Yeah. Honestly, like every day is a stuff. What fucking day is it? Is it Sunday? Is it Wednesday? Now, let's just say every day is Wednesday. How's that? Right. Every day. Hump day, perpetual hump day, like Groundhog Day. Hump day, that's all. And you can't forget what day it is. It's fucking hump day. <laughs> Stare at me. Congrats on 14 years of the cult, uh, a band that I have a theory about, and I'm curious as to what you might think about it. But considering that that record came out in '87, as did Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction, I I feel like in in a in another universe somewhere, had Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction not come out, I feel like the cult's Electric kind of would have been the record for that year. Uh, I love both of those records, obviously, but man, I have. Uh, when I listen to the Cult's Electric, oh, absolutely! I seen that tour, man. Did Actually, you? Uh, Charlie Bonanza and I went together at the Fell Farm in New York, man. No way! Like I was way into the Cult. That was a thing. It's crazy, man. <laughs> 
a love record. It's too, I used to wear a fucking love T-shirt, like man. You know what I mean? Right. How about that? How weird is that? And I'll tell you the story how I got the cult gig. You ready for this yeah. one? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so a long time ago, Billy Duffy and uh, Charlie, he knew those guys, Scott and all. He'd come to shows, and there was one time, like, I knew they were looking for a drummer. I think it was at the time from Matt Sorum, but I was teching for him. Like, you should try out Johnny, but, you know, that was years ago. It didn't work out. I was teching. So many years later, my buddy Ron Lafitte, who was, um, he was Megadeth's manager, and he became the president of frickin' um, of Capitol Records. But at the time, he was he was managing the cult, right? Mm-hmm. And I knew Ron from way back in the day. He was like, hey, dude, they're looking for a drummer. And, like, I think you'd be perfect. You got the fucking look. You got the long hair, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm like, yeah, I love the cult, man. So let's go do this, right? <laughs> so check this out, right? He goes, there's this, this new song, and, you know, Rick Rubin it did, and blah, blah, blah. So, like, all right, I'll come down there. So I, I, I was really confident. I was at my friend's uh, apartment building. I was crashing. I didn't even have a place to stay at the time, if I remember. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, and he drops me off. I didn't have a car. He drops me off at the studio. It's like a fucking million degrees in the valley in L.A., right? <laughs> so I'm gonna, I was like, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to nail this fucking gig. I'm like, all right. <laughs> he chops me off. I'm like confident as hell. I see the one, the receptionist. I'm like, I'm here for the cult. Like, oh, hon, they're not here. They're, they're done. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I talked to the manager. I'm supposed to fucking audition. It's like, no, they're done. I call up Ron. So anyhow, I didn't have a fucking cell phone. My friend drops me off. I have to walk. Now I'm in the middle of nowhere in the fucking <laughs> valley, right? I try to find a pay phone. It's fucking 100 degrees out. I'm like, hold on. I'm like, what the fuck happened, man? I'm like, they didn't show up. He goes, ah, oh, dude, I don't believe, are you kidding me? I'm sorry. And they, they were fucked up at that time. They were banged out or whatever. They were on drunk and passed out. I'm like, oh, great. So, so now I got to call my friend back. Like, dude, there's no cell phone. So I have to wait for him to get home so he can pick up his home from to come get me again. You know, it's like, oh, God. But the funny part of the story is, you ready for this? It's, it gets good, man. Fucking, um, I get the call. Like, what is it? Almost 13 years later, after that fact, um, my my friend Mike Monarulo, who's Anthrax's manager and booking agent, and he's a new uh, Colts booking agent when they just decided to do a, a tour again after so many years in mm-hmm. 2006, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, he goes, "Hey, you should check him out." I'm like, uh, "Yeah, I know those guys are flaky, this and that." So, yeah. So, all right, I give, I'll give it a go. You know, I was I was in Helmand at the time, and we really weren't doing much, to be honest with you. And you know, I was kind of looking to do something different. Yeah. So I'm like, all right. I talked to the manager, and he goes, all right, learn these songs, and there's a DVD, so I learned it all. And so I went in there with the attitude, like I had nothing to lose, because like these fucking ding dongs messed up before, right? I'm gonna just go in there and like just do my shit, and I did. They they were going through like a cattle call of drummers. And I just showed up and like really confident. I live right down the street and like, and I I, I just banged the songs out and they're like, oh cool, you know. Nice. And like, and they asked me to come back again, did that, and then uh, I got the gig. It was Valentine's Day, so it's 14 years. Yeah. Yeah. From 2006. Crazy man. I never thought I longest lasting cult member. How how crazy is that? Unbelievable, man. And two guys died in that band. I mean, they went through a lot of guys, man. Right. And honestly, it's like, I, I know, I feel very comfortable. I love the music, and I just love touring. And, you know, the guys are great, man. You know, we're older, professional. And so it, it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice place to be around. Yeah. Uh, I'm a fan of Billy Duffy, his, his, his guitar tone, his solos, oh, man. His, everything Incredible. about it. I love it that you get to play with that guy. That's fucking awesome. Tell me a little bit about oh, playing yeah. with him. Oh, yeah. Billy, Billy's, yeah. His, yeah. his tones are insane, man. He's got really good dynamics. And to be honest with you, and when I came into the cult, I was a pretty bastard drummer, you know? Right. You know, Helmet and Zombie and all that. And so, yeah. Which was cool, you know, given that thing. But Billy, he told me a lot about dynamics, honestly. It was like, you don't need to play that hard and bash that. You know, I go, yeah. You know, and obviously I take it the wrong way because I'm like, fucking, I just want to rock, man. You know, kind of <laughs> attitude, you know. Like, but later on, uh, it, it helped me out, man. It helped, like, my style. I, I really felt like I became a better drummer dynamically, and I didn't beat myself up either, which is a great thing. Right. You right. know, I, I don't... 
going to break any, really break that many symbols or break, you know what I mean? Sticks, this and that. And it's just nice to have that, that dynamic. It's like, he taught me more of the swing of playing, you know, like the old British guys, which is great. Right. Wow. That is, that is awesome. And then here you are, uh, I guess, have, have you done what? Three full lengths with the cult, uh, thus far? Oh, I, I did uh, two records. We did the EP and a couple songs off the uh, Born, in, Born Into This. Yeah. I was really happy the last record Bob Rock did that record and the tones and just like, and Bob taught me a lot about like approaching this song and that's a whole other thing. It's just being around a whole different game, real professional. You know what right, I mean? And yeah. like, these are the top dogs and Bob Rock. I'm like, holy fuck. Right. <laughs> I better not screw up. <laughs> right, right, right. Was it cool working with him though? Yeah, it was really cool. You know, a little intimidating, but he wants the best out of you, man, and he did that. So, and he goes, and after we talked, he goes, you should be really proud, you know. You you really worked hard, and uh, you did a great job. I'm like, and that meant the world to me, man. Wow, that's crazy. That's, mm-hmm. a, that's a hell of a compliment. I know, from that guy. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> he sold a few records. He made it, no, he yeah. sold, well, what he, he produced, he did a couple things here and there with these couple little bands, so right. as we know. Exactly. But uh, he's great, man. And, uh, man but I tell you, man, I, I, I worked with a lot of producers, but that guy would never leave the studio. He'd come out for like lunch, but he's always in that room listening, right. and what an ear that guy has. Oh, honestly. my God, I bet. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, with a name like Bob Rock, you better... You better rock, Bob. I know. I mean, it would be even cooler if his name was Dick Rock, like Richard Rock, and he just went by Dick Rock. That would be even cooler, just name, name-wise. But, you know, Bob Rock is still pretty good. Exactly, man. So, yeah. But it's cool, man. Like, we, we had some, you know, like I told you earlier, we had dates lined up. But, we, you know, we're always scheduled. We'll get back on course like everyone else will. And Yeah. So, Nice. Get back to fucking normality, man. That would be nice. Some, right? some semblance of normality, whatever that is, and however it's changed. But it would be nice to, yeah, return to whatever that will be. I know, man. Wow, what a crazy! I've been through a lot of shit in my life, man. When I first joined, um, when I was up there with Exodus in '89, I was up there for the San Francisco earthquake, the big one. Whoa! <laughs> you know, I, I was with Gary Hull. We're, we're watching the World Series, and all of a sudden, this shit starts happening. I'm like, whoa! We're kind of <laughs> laughing, like, you know, this is cool. Like, shit's moving around, and then all of a sudden, we had, a, you know, where they lived, they had a house they rented, and you could see the Bay Area Bridge. And shit was bad. It was on fire in the news. I'm like, whoa. this is heavy duty. Oh, yeah. And then I was in the fucking 94 Northridge quake. <laughs> and that thing hit like at four in the morning. I was supposed to drive up to San Francisco, well, Oakland at the time. I was with Testament. So I'm in the, I'm fucking from New York, the Bronx, and I'm in the two biggest earths, biggest earthquakes out here. How about that? <laughs> oh, my God. Like, what the fuck? They're following me, these goddamn things? So, right, right. Yeah. And then, then this whole fucking thing is like, you can't even go anywhere. Earthquakes don't even want to be here right now. <laughs> COVID-19 chased the earthquakes away from the West Coast. My God. They did. Fuck, man. We've talked about all these bands you've been in, the way that you got in them, the subsequent tours, recording processes. That was awesome, touching on all that and the kind of chronology of it. But uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your first drum set and why you started uh, and or how you you gravitated towards the drums in the first place. Okay, so I think what really, really took me into the drums when I was a kid. I was seven years old and I was with my mom watching Hard Day's Night on TV, okay. on ABC, and okay. I seen that, and I seen Ringo. I'm like, wow, that guy's uh-huh. so cool. And just looking at the instrument itself, I'm like, wow, what is that thing? It's so cool. And I just, wow. I, I, it, that's all it took. It actually, like, it took me in, right? So I, I would go yeah. to, like, the encyclopedia, and they, they always had a f- picture of a shitty little fucking three-piece kit. I'm like, what is that? So then they had, uh-huh. then the Sears catalog had some cool ones, and 
And then I'm like, all right. And then I really started looking. And, and but by my, my mom, you know, my parents, they would buy me those cheap kits for Christmas. And I went to, I'd fucking break that thing in like 10 minutes, you know, with the paper heads and stuff. Like, come yeah. on, give me a real kit. <laughs> Anyhow, I was a kid. <laughs> but, but my next door neighbor, Charlie Castelluccio, and he was the reason, honestly. Wow, that's a last name. Yeah, and Castelluccio, who is a <laughs> NYPD fucking undercover cop, okay? Still a good friend of mine, right? Grew up together. So he was older than me, right? And uh, he was my oldest brother's age. So he had a cool kid. He had that, like, that that Sears kit, Blue Sparkle, and he upgraded to a Gold Sparkle, like a five-piece. This was a four-piece yeah, I was a kid. I didn't fucking know anything. So anyway, I, and he knew I he he seen it. I took a liking into drums and music, and I was always looking. And I look up to him because he was he was a cool guy. You know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. he was selling a kit, and he asked my mom. He goes, Mimi, I'll sell a drum kit to Johnny for like give me twenty five bucks. I'm like, and I'm begging 25? my mother. Yeah, twenty five dollars. I mean, we're talking about like you know, dude, it was like seventies and nineteen seventies, right? And the kit probably cost a right. hundred bucks, so or hundred twenty, whatever it was. So. And I'm begging my mother, like, you got to buy this for me, right? So she goes, okay. And we honestly brought the drones right over the porch. She's like handing them over in my mom's, you know, in the basement. My mom had a hair cutting salon. She cut all the old ladies' hair down there. But I set the drum uh-huh. kit up. It was a Sunday. I remember polishing them up and putting jewelry on the drum kit. And that was it, man. I, as soon as I got that kit and I was messing around with configuring it and – that was it. That was honestly, I was like 11, 12, no, 12 years old. And then Charlie, the next door neighbor, now I'm really getting the drums, like watching him play and like listen to records. And he goes, uh, he has a ticket for David Bowie, 1977, Madison Square Garden, extra ticket. So he wow. asked my mom, can I take Johnny to the concert? And she, she said, yes. And we took the train down and that was it, man. And I, I, we had uh, this tickets. This is Madison Square Garden. The tickets weren't great, but they were great for me because I had a side view of Dennis Davis, the drummer, and I watched the whole fucking show. He blew my mind, Madison Square Garden, and that was it. I'm like, this is, this is it. It's my dream. And then many years later, really quick, cut to the chase, Dennis Davis, that yeah. drummer, my first drummer I've ever seen. I met him at the music store on 48th Street, uh, Manny's Music. My friend Marco was a manager, and I always go there to say hi if I'm in town. I think we were doing David Letterman or something. Anyhow, mm-hmm. so I'm like, and Marco goes, Johnny, uh, do you know Dennis? I'm like, what? He goes, Dennis Davis. And I fucking dropped. I, had, I was like, dude, you're the first drummer I've ever seen. He goes, hey, man, I fucking love what you're doing now. Blah, blah, blah. So, I, 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 I'd love to come see you play next time. I'm like, no shit. Are you kidding me, man? So anyhow, wow. I, I went back the next time. It was only a couple weeks later. I think we were there for the David Letterman show. And the next time we're playing, right, the day before, and uh, and I run into him again. Ran into ran, ran into him. Ran into the same store. Same thing. I go. He goes. I want to come see you play. I go. Get out. I go. Marco. Is he is he for real? He goes. Yeah. I'll come check you out. I put him on the guest list. Now this is a big show for me. It's a hometown show. It was a Rob Zombie. It was yeah. Hellbilly Deluxe. The first the first tour. The first time we played New York. Right. Sold out. Wow. Fucking great, you know, and you know, families there, and fucking Tommy Lee and Nikki Six is there, are there, and then <laughs> I'm like, I'm pumped up, I'm ready to throw it down, right? So before I go on stage, I get a knock. There's a security guy who goes, hey, uh, Johnson Pesto. I'm like, yeah, yeah, what's up? Because uh, there's a guy by the name of Dennis Davis. He wants to let you know he's here. I'm like, dude, he fucking showed up. David Bowie's drummer, right? <laughs> I'm like, tell him I'll see him after the show. And this is in Roseland, New York. It was a great venue. Oh, man, right. all these great things closed down. But um, it's a staircase, yeah. a pretty steep stairway. That's the way to get the guests up and down the dress room, go out the door. So after the show, I had the most amazing show. Fucking killed it. Felt really great. Anyhow, after I get ready to go say hi to my friends and family, I open the door, and there's Dennis Davis, the drummer from David Bowie, the first drummer I've ever seen. He looks at me. You know what he does? He fucking he what? bows down to me, dude. I'm like, get the really? fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> he gave me the bow. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. He didn't just bow to me. <laughs> I'm going to knock you out. No, dude, the first time I've seen, could you imagine? Uh, no, that's super freaky. So after we became friends, and, you know, that's the stories I have. So, yeah. And that was a big thing for me, man. 
That was, that's how I got wow. started playing the drums. My first drum kit from Charlie. Charlie takes me to David Bowie. See David Bowie. And then the drummer comes and sees me play. Like, you know, I'm like 12 years old at that concert, dude. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable, man. Yeah. Uh, well, I know you're a record guy. I've got a good uh, collection of vinyl, a lot of stuff from the 70s. That seems to be my jam. Uh, oh, but I know the best from era s- ever of music. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it is, uh, man. One, one I'd like to ask you about a particular drummer uh, in Cozy Powell. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I found out about him, I imagine, as did most people via uh, Rainbow, uh, particularly on the Rising record. Uh, mm-hmm. So t- tell me a little bit about your, your thoughts on him, because uh, he's one of my all-time favorites. Cozy's my, he's my guy, man. It's like there was, a, there was another neighbor in the, uh, in the Bronx, but he had the uh, Rainbow record. I remember seeing him like, wow, first of all, the record's just striking, right, with the fist and everything. Totally. Then I turn it over, I see, like, Cozy Powell. Like, who's this badass with this freaking big Basham Ludwig kit, you know, and he you know, had the yep. big Tom and the cowbell with the rhyme. Like, wow. And anyhow, I, he let me borrow it. I turned, I put, played it, and I was like, holy fuck. It blew my mind. I heard Stargazer. And till this day, one of my favorite songs of all time. It's absolutely incredible. It's fucking incredible. I'm going to take a photo after we get done from the show, what I have hanging my plaque. So as I'm walking around my house right now, I have a poster, Rainbow Rising, right? Check this out. Mm-hmm. When I was on tour with the Colt, our sound guy, Papa Smurf, um, is his name, nickname, but uh, amazing sound guy. <laughs> he worked with all the bands. Anyhow, he was a sound guy for this tour. And we were talking about Cozy. He goes, I didn't know you were a Cozy pal friend. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? You didn't know this whole time I'm a Cozy fucking nut. So he goes, dude. <laughs> He goes, when I get back to Atlanta after this tour, I have something for you. It's in my locker. I'm going to go through my locker. So, anyhow, I get home, and after the tour, two weeks later, he sends me this thing. Dude, it's a print of the Rainbow Rise. It, it was like a poster size, or like, but thick cardboard, really nice, right? But it's wow. signed by the whole band. I have the, It's completely no signed. Way. I, it's signed from Ronnie Cozy to fucking Richie to Jimmy Bain to, uh, yeah, to fucking Carrie. Tony Carey. Wow. And I have cozy sticks encased in there, a pair of cozy sticks that I got from uh, uh, Tony Iommi's assistant's fucking, who was Cozy Powell's drum tech. How about that? Put that one in one sentence. Whoa, that's a lot. <laughs> I just I just have two Rainbow records and a couple of Jeff Beck records. Uh, well, Jeff like Beck, I've been listen listening to. a lot, though, right now, man. That's some shit. But Cozy was the guy, man. He had that sound. Yeah. Like, obviously, I grew up in Bonham, but once I started playing double bass, and, like, yeah. I really I really feel like a lot of my style is Cozy more than anyone. You know, there's, you know, influence, yeah. but that sound. And Cozy had the 26s and the cymbal set up and just... Just everything, man. He was he was a fucking cool dude, man. Look at him, man. He's he's like the Steve yeah. McQueen, well, James Bond more. You know what I mean? Totally. And, you know, driving Ferraris and stuff. You know, he was yeah. badass. <laughs> yeah. And for fuck's sake, his name is Cozy Powell. I mean, it's no geezer butler, but I would say Cozy <laughs> Powell is one of the more ridiculous English names that I could think of. In recent Collins memory. is you know, is Collins is real name, but Cozy. But dude, I'm waiting on the book right now. His book just came out. Right? Yeah, Dance with the Devil. So it's 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 in the mail right now. I can't wait. No way! I didn't know that was a thing. I oh yeah, it. no, it's his book. Yeah, it just it just came out, so I'm excited about that. Wow, man. Yeah, but cozy to me. I got to see him a couple times. Seen him uh, with Michael Schenker's first tour. Opened up for Molly Hatchet at the Palladium in New York. I was like, wow. Whoa. And I seen him with ELP. And as a matter of fact, say I own half of his White Snake drum kit. You own it. Yeah, I, yeah, it's half of his black kit from White Snake. I have the whole, well, oh. just half with the snare drum, and and I uh, have, yeah, that's a big deal. It's like my freaking shrine over there. Holy shit, man! I have two pairs of his drumsticks. One that Ted McKenna, my my dear friend who passed away last year, was a drummer from Michael Schenker band, Michael Schenker group, and Rory Gallagher and. Alex Harvey band, Gary, one of the most amazing Scottish drummers ever. Um, wow. It was my birthday. I was in, I had a day off in Scotland, and we're all there. We 
we're out to lunch, and, and then Ted goes, you guys around later on? Let's get the, I'll bring the drum pad, and we'll hang out and play. And he brought me, it was my birthday, so he get, he gave me a pair of Cozy Powell sticks that Cozy gave to him that he signed to me for my birthday. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, Holy man. Shit. Yeah, and that's deep. <laughs> like, Cozy handed it in his, his hands, and then Ted hands them down to me. And this is like, this is like, you know, British shit, Scottish, man. Right. Wow. That's incredible, man. ACDC, uh, you had said earlier that you're a big fan. Uh, do you Huge. have a particular record? Uh, do you have a particular record that every time it's the go to? You know, I always lean towards the, the, the Bon Scott era stuff. But then yeah, I would like, say um, there's, yeah, there's two, man. And, and this is cool, too. Uh, Highway to Hell, definitely. And then Power Age, okay. right? The- right. Power Age rules. That's got rock and roll damnation. Oh, fuck yeah, man. I think that probably is better. You know, I'm, but then you got touched too much. You got fucking walk all over, man. God, ah, they were, it's so good, man. And you got Sin City and shit. But then you get the live right. record. And my favorite version, I did this with Motor Sister. I'm like, we should play this live. We did it a few year, a couple of years ago with this little fucking, this little bar. You know, Motor Sister, mm-hmm. it has that ACDC thing. I'm like, let's do the live version and let that be rock. And that's so powerful, man. You know? Oh my God! It's it's incredible. And the way we played it was it was balls out. We just like let's just throw it out like get 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 God, man, you just want to break something. Right. Once again, I I know you have that Macintosh system, which I've never yeah. heard. I feel like I've got a pretty good vinyl system here at the house. Everyone that comes over seems to enjoy it. But uh, I haven't heard those, and I've heard they're incredible. So is there any particular record that you've especially enjoyed time and time again on that system that you have? Uh, yeah, there's a few go-tos. I mean, like, especially now because they're made better, like the remastered stuff. You know what sounds like incredible uh-huh. on that? It's Master of Puppets, actually. or like. Oh, it, really? I mean, or, or even the black record, man. You know, it sounds it, oh, well, yeah. so big. You know? But... Uh, Bowie's last record sounds amazing. Oh, Black Star? Black Star sounds so good on the system. Honestly, everything sounds good in there because with the amp, you could tweak <laughs> it out. But oh, I just, it's a process. And that's what I love about vinyl because you take the record out and you go through it, right? It's like, ooh, is right. it hit me right now? You know, it's like, I'm looking at Bowie now. And then, like, yeah. then you go to, like, oh, fuck, Pink Floyd the Wall. Like, That'll be cool, right? Then you take yeah. it out. You take the top of the lid off the turntable. You light the fucker up. You clean the needle. You yeah. lay it in there, and, and you hear that. And it's like it's yeah. pure joy, man. It's great. It is. We've been doing it for a long time. It's funny that with all the technological advancements, uh, we we still resort to things like playing records or listening yeah. to people conversing on a podcast. It's kind of funny, right? It's the, I love it, man. It's still... great fucking talking with you, man. You're a fucking cool dude. <laughs> Absolutely. It was great talking to you as well. Uh, hopefully uh, minimal issues going forward with getting life back together. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get through it, man. Hey, next time we're in New York, we're going to do a fucking, we're going to hug it out and have a beer together. How's that? Dude, we're going to listen to rock and roll, <laughs> hug and drink and have drinks. It's going to be fucking incredible. I fucking <laughs> love it. Let's do it. I wish it was tomorrow, man. But, you know, a little bit, just need a little patience. We'll get through this shit. That's it. Right on, man. Good talking to you, John. You too, Jody. Have a great night, brother. Later, man. Yeah, man. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks to John for rapping. Definitely uh, awesome catching up with him and picking his brain about all the the years of rocking. What a character. Look forward to catching up with him in person at some point. We'll catch you all on the next one. Crash, bang, boom.